I'm a naval aviator. I actually got my pilot's license at age 16. And my dad was in a career Air Force pilot. And I grew up in central Germany because he bounced around to a bunch of different places. I, uh, I'm a rotor head, not by choice. I was voluntold to go fly helicopters in the Navy. Once that happens back in the old days, they we weren't allowed to ch change communities. So I spent pretty much my entire career in the, um, the, what we call a CSAR combat search and rescue, search and rescue, uh, into the world and special operations in the world. Did a little, little ASW enough to know that, uh, it's was not my cup of tea. I've also spent a lot of time, uh, uh, as a staff officer uh, in interesting places, I was uh, recalled for Desert Shield, Desert Storm. I was involved in the tank wars of the 80s. Um, and all this and the 3,000 hours I have in, in military helicopters is proof that I'm immortal. Um, and because they're all built by the lowest bid. Anyway, um, I spent 20 odd years as a business consultant. And then um, in 2015, I chucked it all and decided to become an author full time. And an aviation historian. So you'll, if you go to my website, I've got a bunch of articles on um, and a, on that are aviation related. And also on my website, I read a fun, two fun columns. One's from the hack seat. That's about flying things like what's behind me. And then I do one called fun and dumb, which is fun. And, it's short for fun and dumb things I've done in airplanes and helicopters. Okay. Partly because I'm an, a historian, but also partly because I'm interested in both airplanes. Um, I actually started uh, I was watching a couple of these things on the Discovery Channel and and elsewhere and talking about the top 10, this, that, and the other thing. And the top 10 fighters of World War II, the, the Corsair doesn't even make the list. And I said, wait a second, that's just not, this is not cricket. So um, I'm going to start with the Corsair. I'm going to give you a little background on it. And then I'm going to go into the Mustang, a little background on it. And then I'm going to show you an interesting, some interesting uh, information from a comparison test that was done in 1944. So the Corsair came about because in 1938, the Navy said, we want an, an I'm using the word advanced, carrier-based fighter. Because at the time, they were already in a competition that ultimately led to the F-2A, the Brewster Buffalo, becoming the selected uh, Navy fighter. They bought a bunch of Buffaloes, found that it was not quite what it was advertised. So they went back to Grumman and said, hey, build some F-4Fs. And then the Buffalo uh, became history and the F-4F became the uh, the standard Navy fighter till 1943. And it was replaced actually by this one and then the Hellcat. But what they wanted to do is, is when they built this thing and they designed it, uh, Vought wanted to put the biggest engine they could with the biggest propeller and then build an airframe around it. And what you have is the Corsair. I'll get into how um, the airplane design wound up with a gull wing in a second. But it is the first airplane built in the United States to exceed 400 miles an hour in level flight. And right after that, they got a contract to build this thing. So the way the bent wing came out or the gull wing to use it was they were sitting in a room, they being the design team. And there's actually an article in Naval Aviation News from back in the uh, 50s, on how this came out because they interviewed the people who were in the room. And what they were doing is said, look, we've got this big 13 foot by a four inch prop that Hamilton standard says, we got to bolt onto the front of this thing. And we got this big hairy engine. How the hell do we get ground clearance? And the real, real problem was if you had a really long landing gear, that's that's added weight, uh, it's added complexity to get it back folded into the wing of the fuselage. So somebody said, took a piece of paper literally and bent it in a V and said, we do this. And they did the two gull wings and voila, that's how the gull wing came about. When the first Corsairs were built, they were actually given to the Marine Corps because the Marine Corps was running the operations in the Solomons, which is where the, the uh, we were engaged against the Japanese. The Battle of Guadalcanal didn't actually end until February 43, right around the time the Corsairs arrived. Um, and then the cool thing about the Corsair is it could carry an external bomb load of about 4,000 pounds, which comes to play later in the Korean War when it came, became primarily a close air support airplane. And the Corsair is also the longest, or enjoyed the longest production run of any piston engine fighter in the, made in the U.S. And if you look at the, the chart on the right-hand side, you can see a little bit of how that came about. Uh, it was built by three different people, three different companies. It was Vought, uh, who built the majority of them. General Motors built 
a fair number. And then Brewster Aircraft Corporation was, was built a bunch. They built 700 of them, but there were so many quality problems with them um, that, and they were known as FG1As, that they never were delivered to the customers, which was primarily the Royal Air Force, I mean, the Fleet Air Arm and the US Navy and the French Air Force. Um, so all those Brewster built Corsairs literally were sent to Goodyear to be fixed and they came out as, F as uh, FGs. So it had its problems. One of which they added three feet to the, the production models primarily as a st stability issue. They also increased the armament from uh, 230s and 250s to 650s. Um, the guns in the nose, which were 230s, were taken out. Um, the airplane had wooden ailerons up until 1944 because they would take a solid piece of wood and be able to machine it more precisely than they could make it out of aluminum and with a fabric skin. Um, they also added some fuel tanks in the, in the wingtips, which were not of the self-sealing variety. So if they were hit by a trace around the, and there's still gas or fumes in there, they might catch on fire, but it didn't have any effect on the airplane, uh, on the fact that you had a fire out there, but you could still fly it. It, and if it, once the fuel burned out, um, it's not, it, it just brought, brought the airplane home. The Malkin hood is at that bubble canopy. We borrowed that from the Brits. The, Spit, the Spitfire was the first one to have it. And then we had this program called Program Dog. And everybody talks about this Corsair having problems getting aboard the boat. And that's true. It, the, the, the rebound rate of the Oleos was such that the airplane hit the deck. And if you don't know, a, a Navy landing, is firm, carrier landing is a controlled crash. And so what's happening is the airplane would hit the deck, the airplane would then bounce up into the air, and now they're 25, 30 feet off the deck, and he's out of airspeed and ideas. And it comes crashing down, would go into the barricade, protect the airplanes in the front, because these are straight deck carriers. So you suddenly have an engine change and a, and a bent propeller. So um, they had a couple other problems, one of which was there was hydraulic fluid. We used to leak out of the cow flap actuators and it would spray right back onto the canopy, which made it hard to see. Um, and then the other thing is they did, they changed the seat mounts so you could raise the seat up as high as you could to see over the long nose. But once they figured out how to fix the landing gear, the, carrier, the, the Corsairs came back on the carriers in the, the mid to late 1944. Um, and then they didn't leave the carriers till well after the Korean War. And it's a testament to the airplane's design and its performance. So let's talk about the P-51. I want to spell a couple of myths. There's a myth out there that says the airplane was designed, built, and flown in 120 days. Not true. It was designed and built, the airframe was built in 117 days. It took them another six weeks to get the engine mounted and tested. And then there were six more weeks of ground tests before the airplane flew. So it really is not 120 days. It was really whatever 17 plus six is 23 plus 29 weeks. Um, the second thing is it was the airplane was designed and built for the RAF. They wanted a close air support airplane. Uh, the common term is CAS. Uh, they call it um, uh, Army Cooperation. It was not a turbocharged air, air engine. On or the Allison wasn't a turbocharged engine. And they started flying these Mustangs ones from England in, in 1942. And the Air Force bought 150 of these things, called them Apaches, and they didn't like it. So some smart Brit, uh, to use the, um, uh, they call them technicians, we call them mechanics. Um, the, the slang term for them is boffins. But some smart Brit said, hey, why don't we put a, uh, the engine that's in the Spitfire 9, which was a, the Merlin 61, and bolted the front end of a Mustang. And so they got permission from North American to do that in England. And the Brits, once they got the engine mounted and, and started flying, it went, oh, my God, changes the entire performance of the airplane and, uh, and where it could go, what it could do. It was just like uh, it was a new airplane. So the U.S. Air Force attache in the U.K. Uh, got wind of this project. And he, had, he went to the commanders of the, uh, the USAF in, in England and said, yeah, no, we got to buy this thing. And the Air Force said, no. And it took about six months before the Air Force bent or listened to what the RAF had actually sent somebody to the UK to fly this new airplane. Because the Brits were about to re-engine all their uh, Merlot Mustang ones. And the airplane did not fly in combat 
with the U.S. Air, uh, U.S. pilots, and those is part of the United States Army Air Corps, until December of 43. That is about seven months after the first Corsairs entered combat in fe February of 43. Um, so uh, the, the, the other things that the North American did when they actually were to do the formal redesign was they had the capability for big drop tanks, 150 gallon ones under each airplane. And if you look at um, the, the, the D model, the B and C, uh, and I'll talk about the D in a second, um, they also added an internal fuel tank. And the B and the C's, the only difference was, is the B was built in uh, California and the D was built right here at, Va uh, at Love Field in North American plant uh, here in Dallas. Um, when they built the Ds, uh, they added more fuse, more tankage in the fuselage. And if you don't know it, if you if you um, uh, didn't burn fuel out of the um, uh, fuselage tank first, uh, if you try to pull Gs or do sharp turns, the airplane would uh, go ass over T kettle and wind up in a spin. It also increased the empty weight a lot uh, when they built the Ds. And the other thing that they built in the Ds was the long uh, dorsal fin um, in front of the rudder because the Bs and Cs had directional problems at higher speeds above 300 knots. Uh, and also, by the way, the D model was the first airplane ever equipped in the U.S. With a G, for G-suit. They didn't start using them until late 44, early 45, but I thought that was an interesting footnote. So the, everybody thinks that the war in the Pacific and the war in Germany, the air war, was a lot different. Well, it was geographically, obviously, but there was not as much difference as you think when both these airplanes entered combat. So I'm going to start with the Japanese uh, and, versus the Corsair. So <clears throat> the Zero um, was a primary fighter for the Japanese, and there's an Army version um, that was very similar in performance. And both those airplanes were totally outperformed by both the Hellcat and the Corsair. Um, the Japanese Navy was stretched very thin over the Pacific. After Midway and after the Battle of Solomons, uh, they a lot they had a lot of problems. They were running out of people. They were run, when I say running out of people, they I mean by this I mean they could not train pilots fast enough to replace that they were losing. They were not taking pilots out of uh, the combat theaters and using them to educate or train the guys coming through the training program. They had problems because they couldn't get enough oil because submarines were sinking their tankers. So the flight training programs dropped off for different reasons that happened in Germany. I'll get to that in a second. But what was happening is in uh, the Japanese were short of raw materials, fuel, bauxite to make aluminum, iron ore to make steel. All these things were winding up at the bottom of the ocean thanks to the U.S. Navy submarine campaign. So all this hindered and uh, the Japanese Air Force and the Japanese Naval Air Force and the quality of their pilots went down the hill in a hurry. Okay, so you switch to Europe and we're in an attrition battle with the Luftwaffe and theoretically the P-51, P-47, and P-38 outperformed the best of the German fighters. But the real problem was that the Luftwaffe was overextended. They were fighting in the, against the Soviet Union, they're fighting in Italy, and they're fighting in uh, over France. And again, they were having problems with fuel um, because they, we were bombing the, the refineries in Ploesti, Ploesti in Romania, um, which is their only real source of fuel until they began to turn coal into a low octane fuel. Uh, and they could get it to about 80 octane uh, gasoline. But the point of the matter is it not only uh, hindered their, at the tactical level of the flight operations, the fighting, but it also hindered flight training. And then the other problem that the Germans had that the Japanese didn't have was the amount of safe airspace to do flight training was rapidly decreasing. So the Germans' primary uh, flight training base was at first in Felbruck, which was outside, um, uh, it's about 30 miles northwest of Munich. And by 1944, uh, it was already subject to uh, strafing attacks and other attacks by uh, bomber, medium bombers uh, of the, the Allied Air Forces. So the point being is that there's no safe uh, space in Germany, and the average Luftwaffe pilot reporting to his first squadron after flight training had less than 150 hours. This contrasts with both the Army and, and, and the Navy's practice of the first, when you fly your first combat sortie, you got somewhere around 350 hours. You got 250 roughly in flight training. You went to what the Navy calls a RAG, the Air Force called an, or the Brits called an OTU, Operational Training Unit. The Air Force had a similar thing, and there you transition to the 
airplane, you're going to fly in combat, and you're instructed by guys who flew the airplane in combat, and you got somewhere around 80 to 100 hours in the airplane, and then, and only then would you take off on your first combat mission. So the quality of the pilots that these airplanes, the, F, the Corsairs and the P-51s, was not the same as they were uh, at the beginning, or at least their opponents were not the same as they were at the end of the year. Yes, there were still some aces on both sides, both the Japanese and the and the Germans, but by and large, they were starting to be, um, the current word is a trite, killed off or injured. So both airplanes have distinguished record combat records. So I want to talk about the kill ratio for a, se- for a second. Um, the Navy and the Marine Corps only count airplanes shot down if you shoot it down in the air. The Air Force was giving kills to air to pilots who sh- strafed an airplane on a runway or on a field and it blew up or was obviously showed that signs of damage so about 20 percent of the airplanes in this 4950 of them uh, I, I actually have the number in here uh, 716 were uh, killed on or blown up on the ground which really brings it down to about a 16 to one or a little less than that uh, kill ratio is still pretty significant so now so Again, both airplanes enabled the Army Air Forces and the Navy to, and Marine Corps to gain air superiority. Um, if you don't know this, uh, everybody talks about the long-range missions from England to Berlin. It's, seven, it's 680 miles. When the Corsairs began flying missions out of Guadalcanal, it's 650 miles to Rabul, which is, and it's all, by the way, all over water, except a few islands. Uh, so if you land on the islands, you get either bitten or bitten by poisonous snakes or bugs or eaten by alligators, or you wind up in the ocean, you become shark food. Um, the only water between London or the East Anglia in England and Germany or Berlin was the English Channel. It's only about 25 to 50 miles wide, depending on where you cross it. And by the way, the Korea in Korea, a Marine Corps there is the only airplane, piston engine airplane that shot down um, a MiG-15. And early in the war, the Air Force which was started out using the P-51s as for close air support, pull them out because uh, they're getting shot down because it's very vulnerable to ground fire. And that's true of any uh, inline engine airplane. So in 1944, um, there was pressure on the Navy to adopt the P-51 as its frontline fighter. And there was pressure on the Air Force to look at the Corsair as its frontline fighter. So what the Navy did at the behest of the Congress and also both services is conduct a flight test. And as it turns out, it's a P-51B versus an F-4U-1 and a 1A. And the differences are minor uh, from a from an aerodynamics and performance perspective. Um, the D model wasn't available at the time. And they had problems with the C. They had an engine failure, actually. And so they, they, the Air Force had to come back or the Army Air Corps had to come back and, and take the airplane. So the pilots who flew this thing out of Patuxent River, Maryland, were all combat veterans of the Pacific War. So they're all veteran pilots, fighter pilots. I've got the list someplace if you want to if you want to see it. And they were both production models. What they did is they literally took airplanes out of squadrons. So these weren't uh, souped up airplanes that came right off the production line and were modified by the manufacturer. In fact, the, the, uh, the there's notes in the test report about the rough finish of the uh, Corsairs and how battered they were. So apparently the squadrons that gave them up had, um, you know, they were, I won't say they're hangar queens, but they were well used. The other interesting thing that was remarked was that they, well, they took the tail hooks off. Um, somebody had cut three inches off each of the propellers, uh, propeller blades uh, to reduce the diameter, which had a significant impact or an impact on the performance. Um, it's noted in the test report that it had an impact, but they didn't sit there and measure it because they didn't have an airplane with a full diameter propeller assigned to it. And they were all flown in the combat portion portion of the test at uh, they take off with full internal fuel, full ammunition. And when they started fighting or doing the simulated dog fighting, they are roughly 50 to 60 percent of their fuel load. So it's representative of what would, it would be like in the real world. So these are just comments from the test report of the B model. And and I thought this was really interesting was that they thought the cockpit is cramped. Now I've sat in a 51 cockpit and I've sat in a Corsair cockpit. I'm 5'9 and 100 and, and too many, about 175, 180 pounds. And I'm not cramped. And most of the guys who flew at that era were about my size or smaller. So I found that kind of interesting. The Corsair cockpit is, by the way, much bigger. 
Um, and again, because these were P51s with the Razorbacks, they didn't have the bubble canopy. There are problems with visibility, particularly with the frames of the canopy blocking view in various directions. What I thought was really interesting was the last two points on the slide was that in the P51, the way you selected tanks is by which boost pumps you selected. So if you had battle damage and you selected a tank that had, let's say, the least amount of fuel in it, um, and you had an electrical problem and you, you couldn't feed, you know, you couldn't use the other boost pumps, that's all the fuel you had. You couldn't transfer fuel around. The Corsair has a much simpler system. It's left, right, and off. Um, and actually, it's when you had the outboard tanks, it's left outboard, in, left, uh, left inboard, right outboard, uh, right inboard, and then the centerline tank, because they all fed into the center tank, which was right in front of the cockpit. Um, and then the other thing I thought was interesting was the Corsair carries a significantly more ammunition. So each of its 650s have 400 rounds per gun. In the P-51B and the C and the D, they only have, um, I think it's 240 rounds per gun for the, the, two, the inboard gun and 300 for the outboard guns. Anyway, it has uh, basically 30, uh, 24 seconds of firing uh, less, or excuse me, versus the 35 in the Corsair. So I thought that was kind of interesting. We're talking about highly uh, supercharged or supercharged engines. And I think the manifold pressure uh, limits that these guys are flying was pretty significant. Now, I've got a lot of hours in the T-28, which is a two-stage supercharged R-1820. And we could go theoretically to 60 inches. We never did. We basically maxed out at 48. And But these are the pressures they could do this. Now, part of the, um, the ability to do this is because the U.S., by this time in the year, year, war was using 115, 145 octane gas. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but if you put it in a car engine, it melts the pistons and valves. But that's the maximum power they could um, pull. And the, 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 P, the A model, the Corsair had water injection, so it could pull, it, it could sustain the 60 inches of manifold pressure for longer than the five minute limit on the, um, on the Dash 1. So this is what I thought was kind of interesting. They thought, that, as it turns out, the P-51 had a market superiority in initial um, acceleration. But after the airplanes flew for you know, a couple of seconds, the Corsair would start to run away with it. And uh, it, had, it was a better airplane to fly at low speeds. Part of the problem was the fact that the, the, the uh, B and C models, or the B model didn't have the, the dorsal fin, which added stability. But the, it, the, the, the the Navy pilots thought that the, the Mustang was a handful in the traffic pattern. So here are the four conclusions. And I'm, I'm going to talk about these, a uh, couple of these in some detail. There's not a lot of difference between the airplanes on the fact that um, the Corsair actually performed better pretty much throughout the entire flight envelope. It climbed better, like a thousand feet per minute better, which is significant tactically. It had a better roll rate and it could turn well, easily turn inside the P-51 at any airspeed. Um, that's slower, the slow airspeeds, actually the Corsair was even better. And uh, higher airspeeds, it was had, had a significantly better, not only rate of turn, which is how fast you go around the corner, but also radius of turn. And obviously with more ammunition, you, know, you can stay in the fight longer. And their point was, is that if the fights were below 25,000 feet, that the Corsair was better at pretty much every every aspect was faster, climb better, dive at the same speeds, turn better, all those characteristics. Above 25,000 feet, uh, the Mustang was noticeably superior. Now, if you look at this and you look where most of the dogfighting took place in Europe, it was well below 25,000 feet. And I can get into how uh, World War II dogfights started, but keep in mind back in those days, you didn't have more uh, thrust to weight ratios or power to weight ratio is greater than one to one. So as soon as you went to about 70 degrees angle bank, you, the airplane was descending. And the more Gs you put on the airplane, the faster the airplane descended. So most of the dogfights were descending spirals that have a decreasing radius. And I can explain why if you want me to. So this is a chart that shows the four airplanes and the green is where they're actually superior. What's really interesting is the Corsair is a lot heavier and bigger. If you ever see the two airplanes next to each other, the Corsair is a bigger airplane. Um, but it has uh, a lower power to weight ratio, mainly because uh, it has more horsepower. Uh, Corsairs were getting you know, 2,000 plus horsepower out of the R2800. R the Mustang was getting max 1,700. 
out of the um, uh, the Allison or the packet Allison. So I can go through this whole chart if you want, but uh, the net net is when they flew these airplanes against each other in mock dogfights, the Corsair uh, won hands down. I have another report I don't want to get into in this one, in which the Navy did the same thing with the Falco F-190. They had two different versions of it uh, the, and the ME-109. They flew the Corsair, the Hellcat, and the Wildcat against the, the German fighters r- actually right after this test was done. And again, I, I was stunned that the Corsair could turn inside the D-model F-190, which was supposedly uh, the only airplane that could turn inside a spit. So I thought that was pretty, pretty, consist- con- pretty interesting. So with that, uh, by the way, uh, I mentioned these are the books I've written. Five of these have become Amazon bestsellers. Um, there's a lot of helicopter flying in some of them. There's fixed wing flying in, in pretty much every one as well as helicopter flying in them, except the ones about during take place during the American Revolution because they didn't have helicopters or airplanes in those days. 